17, it was 17. Hi everybody, my name is Steve Brand, and I'm going to be videotaping uh, Shai's lecture today for a documentary I'm uh, working on about Abraham Joshua Heschel. And if anybody, I'm most, you know, mostly I'm reviewing him, but I might, if there isn't any objection, I'd also like to get the Q&A and maybe some listening shots. So if there's anybody, this is a film that would be primarily for public television and educational use. Uh, if there is anybody who does not wish to be on camera, please raise your hand and I will avoid filming you. Okay, that's fine. Uh, anybody else? Okay. And just ask if maybe the people who don't want you don't want to sit in the same area, that would be very helpful. <laughs> uh, there's a young lady over here if you would like. Is that okay? Might okay. I ask you? Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else who doesn't want to go? Okay. Anybody else who's bad? Anybody, anybody who doesn't want to go? You know, sitting behind in the back there somewhere in a perfect place. Thank you very much. Tell me that you my legs. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. I didn't even have shy. Thank you for um, joining me for the fourth um, installment of this series on Abraham Joshua Heschel's um, vision of a spiritual life. This lecture is entitled, Awake, Why Sleepest Thou, O Lord, Heschel and the Holocaust. As is well known, Heschel lost much of his family and the world that had nurtured him in the nightmares of the Shoah. What I want to try and do tonight is ask a question that is at once a very simple and straightforward question, and at the same time is obviously the very opposite of simple and straightforward. And that is to ask, how did his enormous losses on the reality of the Holocaust affect his relationship with God? In his posthumously published A Passion for Truth, Abraham Joshua Heschel speaks of Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kutz, anger at God. Passion for Truth is an English language biographical portrait of Menachem Mendel of Kutz, one of the most colorful figures in the history of Hasidut. The Kutzker was enraged by hypocrisy, by deceit, by dishonesty. And he railed at humanity for its deep and abiding moral and spiritual failures. If your image of Hasidu is that it's warm and fuzzy, you have never read about the Kutzker. He was the very opposite of warm and fuzzy. He was like a living, breathing bludgeon. But his anger, the Kutzker's anger extended further. He was not just angry at human beings for their failures, but his anger extended onward toward the creator of human beings. Under the Rebbe's reverence, Heschel writes, quote, was dissent and contentiousness, a sense of outrage at the depth of falsehood afflicting the world, as well as silent animadversion. Was only man to blame? The Kutzker uncompromisingly castigated his fellow men, but did not castigation itself cast reproach upon their maker? Did not castigation itself cast reproach upon their maker? I suspect what he means by that, by the way, is something like this. It's very common for religious people, including for very accomplished religious philosophers, to say something like this. Well, it's not God's fault, it's human freedom. And as we're going to see, Heschel says that too, among many other things that he says. The problem is, who created human beings with that kind of freedom, and with the kind of freedom that has the capacity to imagine the kind of brutality human beings have the capacity to imagine? Meaning. The argument that is kind of that emerges here a little bit, not even an argument actually, it's a kind of like a throwaway comment, is you think that the free will defense gets God off the hook, but actually it may put God further on the hook. Because who is responsible 
for this kind of freedom. This is an argument that becomes explicit, by the way, in more recent Catholic theology, and a, a, a thinker called Johann Baptist Metz, who basically said the freedom of defense is a very weird, weird argument. Precisely for this reason, because God is the one who endowed us with imagination that enables us to imagine these crazy things. We'll come back to that later. But the Kutzker was not just angry. According to Esh Heschel, he was also filled with very profound doubt. If mendacity, dishonesty enraged him, uncertainty tortured him. Heschel describes the Kutzker as saying the following, if only I could be certain that there is punishment in the world to come, I would go out into the streets and dance for joy. If only I could be certain. It doesn't require much of a stretch, at least I don't think it requires much of a stretch, to suggest that at moments like this, in this, Heschel's final work, he allowed the Kutzker to speak on his own behalf, to give voice to some of his own most deeply felt, but only very haltingly spoken, ambivalences about faith. Heschel wrote movingly of how he had discovered the Kutzker as a young child, and how the Kutzker had remained what he called, quote, a steady companion and a haunting challenge, end quote. The Kutzker, Heschel said, had, quote, urged me to confront perplexities that I might have preferred to evade. Heschel describes quite movingly at the beginning of this book the way that his religious life moves between two poles. One, represented by the Baal Shem Tov, taught him to live in a world suffused with meaning, suffused with the presence of God. Late atar panuimune, as Hasidim liked to quote. There is no place where God is not present. But the other pole, represented by the Kutzker, taught him to face what he called the immense mountains of absurdity that also stood before him. In other words, if the Baal Shem Tov represented for him the sustaining faith which he held to so tenaciously over the course of his life, the Kutzker represented something else, namely the monstrous possibility that maybe all there is in life is disappointment. And I'm going to suggest over the course of this talk that actually part of Heschel's spiritual genius is his absolute refusal to let go of either one of those poles. Not to pick one, but to hold them together. In allowing himself to be guided by both the Baal Shem Tov and the Kutzker, Heschel confessed, quote, I had allowed two forces to carry on a struggle within me. For Heschel, I'm suggesting, the Kutzker served at least partly as a vehicle for expressing his own post-Holocaust anger and doubt. To live with both of them, now these are Heschel word, Heschel's words, was, quote, to live both in awe and consternation, in fervor and horror, with my conscience on mercy and my eyes on Auschwitz. My conscience on mercy and my eyes on Auschwitz. There, in case we haven't gotten the hint, he's basically telling us that the Kutzker is Auschwitz. The Kutzker is the response to Auschwitz. Auschwitz told his mercy. Kutzker, the anger, the frustration, the doubt, the uncertainty that Kutzker represents, that's Auschwitz. Wavering, Heschel says, between exaltation and dismay. Heschel wants to be sure that that link is unmistakable, hence describing the Baal Shem Tov and, Kut and the Kutzker, both dead by 1860, right? And yet, one of them is about Auschwitz, right? So clearly on some level, He's a stand-in. I want to talk briefly about one of the chapters in A Passion for Truth called The Kutzker and Job that I think is extremely important to faith, doubt, and disappointment. Now, by the way, in your packets, unlike in previous sessions, I did not create a story sheet. What you have in there is a, something we're going to talk about later, a complete chapter for Man is Not Alone. Um, that is, I'm going to make an argument for how to read that chapter differently than it's usually read. But for now, I'm just going to talk a little bit first about this book of Passion for Truth that you don't have in front of you. Now, I want to offer the following caveat to the interpretation I'm about to offer. Heschel's discussion of the Kutzker and Job is the least linear chapter of what is probably his least linear book. Okay? So once again, I am faced with the task of trying to construct order out of something that is not presented in an orderly way. But I think we can identify several recurring motifs in the chapter that really articulate what I suspect is Heschel's response to the problems of anger and doubt after the Shoah. The first is what Heschel calls the Kutzker's, quote, 
<clears throat> refusal to accept the harshness of God's ways in the name of God's love, and his willingness to confront <coughs> and argue with God as if to say, this is Heschel, thy will be changed. Right? The opposite, that is, of the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. Right? The, the Kutzker is about protest. There was, for Menachem Mendel, only one way to survive, Heschel says, quote, to be holy in challenging God, to pray militantly, to worship heroically, end quote. His approach was, again, quote, to protest, to contradict, to reject <coughs> in the name of higher visions. Heschel, in this book, embraces the Kutzker's defiance, pointing out that it represents a venerable tradition in Jewish theology going back all the way to Abraham. The outcry of anguish, he says, quote, certainly adds more to God's glory than callousness or even flattery of the God of pathos. Right? There is tremendous faith in a certain kind of protest. But here's the problem. The Kutzker's anger moves him to challenge God, but there are also countervailing forces that drive him towards silence. And that's the central tension of Heschel's presentation of the Kutzker and the problem of evil is that on the one hand, he wants to shrink give up. He wants to scream his head off, God, where are you? And on the other hand, there are all these voices in him that say, be quiet. And I want to sort of spend a couple minutes looking at what those voices of quiet are. First, the Kutzker, in good Jewish form, worried about impudence, what we might call in rabbinic language, chutzpah klape shmai, right? Excessive audacity in speaking to God. Although the Kutzker refused to capitulate, he says, even to the Lord, he understood that there had to be limits. To use Heschel's language, temerity could easily spill over into impudence. Quote, the precarious dividing line between righteousness and presumption was better couched in silence. Thus, he says, although the Kutzker reasoned with audacity, he walked in awe. So the first issue is the fear of impudence, or what Heschel calls effrontery. Second, the Kutzker also accepted limits on what human beings could understand and know. Right? It's a classic religious posture. When all was said and done, there were boundaries beyond which human understanding could not go. Heschel's characterization of the Kutzker, quote, no matter how painfully palpable the perplexity, any possible solution to it was hidden. A man of flesh and blood was simply not meant to comprehend the divine response to the deepest of human problems. Divine secrets were not compatible with the human intellect." End quote. So in other words, to worship a transcendent God is to accept the reality of not being able to understand that God. That is at the core of our being as a religious person, right? To understand that there are limits to what we can know. All this meant, Heschel says, quote, that Reb Mendel knew full well how the most fiery accusations could sound like gibberish when articulated. No wonder, then, that he tended to, preoccupied, to be preoccupied with silence. So we have, so far, we actually have two very classically, you could say, from voices for silence. Very traditionally religious arguments for silence. One is the fear of being disrespectful, impudent towards God, and two, the fear of failing to accept the limits that come necessarily with being human in trying to understand God. But there is a third that I think is um, more powerful and more important. And this, I think, is really the core of what Heschel is interested in here. <coughs> There's a much more tragic reason for silence in Heschel. And here, I think, you can begin to catch a glimpse of the depth of his pain as a religious thinker and as a human being. Heschel's Kutzker insisted that although God does deserve to be interrogated, <laughs> human beings lack the moral credibility to do the interrogating. This is an amazing moment of pathos in his writing, right? God does deserve to be called to question, but human beings, given what we have demonstrated about ourselves in the 20th century, are going to do that questioning? Could human beings really accuse God over their own, our own appalling behavior? Quote, in a world where God is denied, where his will is defined, Torah flouted, compassion sloughed, 
violence applauded, in a world where God is left without allies, is it meaningful for us to court-martial him? Now, I want to be absolutely clear, because I think there's a wrong way to read this. I do not think at all that Heschel is here suggesting that humanity's cruelty somehow implies God's innocence. I think that's not what he's saying. He's saying something much more difficult and tragic than that. The situation is extremely complex in that sense. Humanity's guilt means not that God is off the hook, but that human beings have no leg to stand on in accosting God. Tellingly, Heschel says, the Kutzker knew, quote, <coughs> that the phrases that a man thrust against heaven could easily boomerang. The word boomerang here is extremely important. It is the last word, boomerang, right? What does it mean? Any challenge that a human being can direct at God can quickly be turned back against us. Thus, we are left silent, mute, as a result of our own callousness. That, I think, is the core of Heschel's religious dilemma. And I think it is something he struggles with all the way down in his writing. And it's a dilemma that I'm, I want to sort of be quick to add. I don't think he purported at all to solve. On the one hand, he was moved by this extremely profound sense that God, too, was implicated by human cruelty and injustice. But on the other hand, he felt paralyzed by a pervasive sense of humanity's own unspeakable guilt. And by the resulting, let's say, obscenity of us putting God on the dock. You can sort of imagine a dialogue as Heschel imagines it. Who are you to accuse me? God says. It is true that I permitted gas chambers, but you built them. In cuts, therefore, Heschel says, and in this way I want to say, in Heschel's study as well, quote, they cultivated the eloquence of silence. They cultivated the eloquence of silence. We're going to come back to that sort of tragic situation as he understands it. Heschel makes one other move in this chapter which we should take a moment to think about. He tries to shift the focus from humanity's suffering to God's, something which if you've ever read Torah and Hashemayim, you'll be familiar with as his vision of Rabbi Akiva's spirituality. Heschel reminds his readers that God, too, is in need of compassion. He ends his discussion of the Kutzker and Job with a story that some find very meaningful and some scholars dismiss as, quote, precious. Leave that for your own um, judgment. He tells the story of a Jewish functionary who meets, quote, an emaciated, poorly clad Jew on a train in post-Holocaust Poland. The emaciated Jew is so devastated and filled with rage that he refuses to pray. Eventually, however, after many hours on the train, he pulls out his talus and tefillin and begins to daven after all. So the functionary asks him, what are you doing? And the Jew declares, quote, it suddenly dawned upon me to think how lonely God must be. Look who he is left with. I felt sorry for him, End quote. Ultimately, Heschel argues, God asks not just for compassion, but also for heroic levels of faithfulness. What suffering calls for, in other words, Heschel argues, this is the deeply, deeply pious side, is not the abandonment of faith, but it's impassioned reaffirmation. What God wants from us is the courage to affirm faith even, and maybe even especially, amidst desolation. Here, I think playing on a verse in Psalms, Heschel writes the following. In the brightness of the morning, we sing praise. In the loneliness of the night, we should have faith. Quote, this means being faithful to God even in extreme misery. When we have every reason in the world to grieve, to lament, we should be able to lean on faith. Heschel is no doubt speaking of his own generation when he writes, quote, God does not need those who praise him in a state of euphoria. He needs those who are in love with him when in distress, both he and ourselves. Those who are in love with him when in distress, both he and ourselves. This is the task, in the darkest night, to be certain of the dawn, to go through hell, and to continue to trust in the goodness of God. This is the challenge and the way." End quote. Now, 
where does all of this leave us? What has Heschel just done here? There is a widespread view. It is the dominant view in the world of Heschel scholarship. The widespread view among scholars is that Heschel thinks he has, quote, solved the problem of evil by moving the blame from God to humanity. As I've already sort of suggested, I think this view is at best too simplistic and at worst, not to put too fine a point on it, just plain wrong. And I think it actually dissipates some of what is most religiously and theologically compelling and interesting in Heschel. Heschel's protestations against human brutality and indifference on the one hand, and his declarations of compassionate faithfulness to God on the other, do serve to soften to some degree in Heschel the horrible sting of evil, and maybe they even serve to mitigate a bit the severity of Heschel's accusations against God. But on my reading, and I'll try to develop this some length, they do not in any way resolve the problem. They do not exonerate God from ultimate responsibility. In the example, my friend Zachary Braderman, author of an important book on post-Holocaust theology, says something I think is simply mistaken. He says, quote, upon comparing the Kutzko with Job, Heschel immediately retracted his own religious protest. Heschel retracted it, Braderman says. Heschel's work, I want to be clear, does contain the broad contours of a theodicy. It does contain an outline for how he thinks religious people ought to think about the problem of evil. And, and that is basically, as we've seen the last few weeks, about what it means for a god to seek human beings so profoundly as to surrender, as it were, God's active omnipotence. That is to say, I will not run the world with a heavy hand. I am truly going to engage in some kind of tzimtzum, some kind of self-contraction, that really allows human freedom to run the world. And as we've seen, Heschel takes very seriously this multifaceted impulse towards silence. But I don't think this internal movement towards silence at all constitutes a retraction. And here, just to speak philosophy for a second, dialectic is not the same as retraction. Dialectic means actually living with two poles, which I think is exactly what Heschel has told us he's going to do by invoking both the Baal Shem Tov and the Kutzker. In any case, it is surely an exaggeration to suggest, as Braderman does, that, quote, the initial voice of anger directed towards God represented nothing more significant than an effective strategic device. Heschel rhetorically challenged God in order to enter more forcefully the charge in God's defense against the culture of modernity. Heschel's writing, I'll just say this in a very simple, almost like methodological way, his writing is neither neat enough nor disingenuous enough to be doing what Braderman suggests he's doing. Meaning, there is surely a middle ground between protest as the only and final word on the one hand and protest as a mere strategic device to get God off the hook on the other. There is a tremendous amount of space between those two things. And I would suggest there is too much pathos in Heschel's argument with God, as I even tried to share with you in some of the quotes I've read, for it to be interpreted solely as a rhetorical strategy. I'll take that one step further, and then I'll actually try to interpret what I think Heschel really is doing with the problem of evil. In a book that begins with a confession of the author's feeling pulled in divergent directions by contrasting voices, it seems to me to be a poor reading to interpret his ultimate position on the religious question that matters most to him as fully resolved and clear cut. God's off the hook, we're on the hook. The whole setup of the book is about two voices that are not easily reconciled, that rub up against each other, that struggle with each other. It's like a very odd thing to conclude that really the argument of the book is, here's an answer, as opposed to, here's a problem that I can't fully resolve. In other words, as a person of deep faith and as a religious teacher, Heschel was inclined towards defense of and affirmation of God. But as a person who also unblinkingly witnessed the extent of human callousness and suffering, he knew all too well the inadequacy of his own theology. Sometimes I feel one of the great boons to modern religious life would be if everyone were a little more aware of the inadequacy of their own theology. Above all, I think, 
As a man of enormous complexity, he has chewed ultimate solutions to the problem of evil. Okay, now, so what am I doing here? We are going to try now to read together a chapter um, from Man is Not Alone that is, I think, one of the most interesting pieces of writing we have from Heschel. It's chapter 16, Man is Not Alone, called The Hiding God. You have the entire chapter. And we're going to see what I think these two voices, how they play themselves out. This chapter begins with a spirited defense of God, a fierce and impassioned defense of God, and then culminates rather abruptly, without coherent transition, in an explosion of anger against God. And then in chapter 17, we simply move on. Right? And I want to sort of understand what's going on a little bit in this chapter. Heschel begins as God's defender. He begins, in other words, as if Braderman is right. He begins as God's defender, dismissing the notion that contemporary times call forward the vexed question of theodicy with any particular urgency. After all, it is not God but human beings who have committed history's most egregious crimes. Passage 1, the major folly of pressing the issue of theodicy, Heschel writes, quote, seems to lie in its shifting the responsibility for man's plight from man to God, and accusing the invisible of the iniquity is ours. Rather than admit our own guilt, we seek, like Adam, to shift the blame upon someone else. For those of you in my Genesis class, right? This is the accusation that all of humanity is like Adam. Someone else did it. A few sentences later, Heschel adds, God is now thought of as the ultimate scapegoat. Put simply, and in language Heschel might have well have rejected for being too sober and detached, Heschel here seems to argue for a version of what's called the free will theodicy, according to which human beings, rather than God, are accountable for the evil that pervades and degrades human life. Passage 2, God is not silent, God has been silenced. Now, religion itself, and here Heschel is kind of upping the ante, religion itself is implicated in human evil. Passage 2b, mired in hypocrisy, religion has at one and the same time, quote, preached and eluded God, praised and defied him. It has led humanity astray with false promises and an infantile theology. Now I'm quoting again, instead of being taught to answer the direct commands of God with a conscience open to his will, human beings have been, quote, fed on the sweetness of mythology, on promises of salvation and immortality, as a dessert to the pleasant repast on earth, end quote. By the way, in case this sounds schmaltzy, let's just look here what he's saying here, right? People experience religion as about, what do I get out of this? Why am I a religious person? Because I want to be rewarded. I want good stuff, whether that means in classical terms, olam haba, or whether it means feeling good about my sort of divinely blessed bourgeois life in suburban New Jersey, right? Whatever it is. But the ways in which, you don't live there anymore, calm down. The, 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 the issue is, the issue is, right, in other words, is religion that? Is it a form of basically asking in some cosmic way what's in it for me? Or is it about being called to answer a question, where are you, what are you responsible to? What are you responsive to? Right? That's the question. And he says religion is guilty in that it's basically oriented people to the wrong Issues. If you go back to some of what I talked about in the previous lectures, in other words, another way of saying that is religion has actually done the opposite of making people self-transcendent. Because it makes them focused on what's being promised to them. As opposed to being focused on what's being asked of us. Mature theology recognizes that God is not, quote, some watchman hired to prevent us from using our loaded guns, end quote. Therefore, it makes no sense to cast God as the ultimate scapegoat for our murderous behavior. All of this, of course, opens up in a huge way the question of providence. And Heschel's response is innovative and audacious. Whether or not it's satisfying, we can talk about either now or in the question and answer period. But it's certainly innovative, and in good traditional Jewish form, he does not raise his hand and say, I'm about to say something totally audacious and revolutionary. He actually just sort of says it. Um, as if it's a kind of traditional idea. Quote, passage three. We have witnessed in history how often a man, a group, or a nation, lost from the sight of God, 
acts and succeeds, strives and achieves, but is given up on by God. They may strive from one victory to another, and yet they are done with and abandoned, renounced and cast aside. They may possess all glory and might, but their life will be dismal. God has withdrawn from their life, even while they are heaping wickedness upon cruelty and malice upon evil. The dismissal of man, the abrogation of providence, inaugurates eventual calamity. Now I want to just try to unpack this paragraph for a minute. The process Heschel describes here is extremely complex. A people abandons God, thereby leading God to turn away. The evil nation is, quote, left alone. The divine does not interfere with their actions nor intervene in their conscience, end quote. God's turning away from the Germans, for example, means that there is no one to restrain their most murderous impulses. They turn into godless beasts of prey, even as they seem to achieve worldly success. They will, Heschel seems confident in this passage, ultimately be undone by their own evil. But in the meantime, it seems, providence allows them free reign over their enemies. Eventual calamity will befall the evil nation, but immense suffering will first be the fate of its victims. By the way, footnote, it would be an extremely interesting project to compare Heschel's very interesting, untraditional use of the category of hysteropanim, the hiding of the divine faith, with Eliezer Berkowitz's equally untraditional and audacious use of the term hysteropanim. Both of them attempting to try to sort of figure out how do I understand God's not intervening. Now, Heschel states this all in such a matter-of-fact way that it's easy to miss the bold originality of his argument. It is not the Jews who are the object of divine abandonment. It is actually the Germans. But both the Jews and the Germans suffer in very different ways, obviously in very different ways, the horrific consequences of divine turning away. Since God works to dissuade the perpetrator rather than intervening in history to save the victim, those who utterly quash their conscience effectively exile God from the world. Right? If providence, now Heschel nowhere develops a kind of systematic theory of providence or even a systematic theory of anything. But, and I don't think he's consistent about providence in different places, but here, providence seems to be about how is God providentially involved in the world? God lives in the pricks of our conscience. And so I have the freedom in actually refusing to heed the voice of my conscience to effectively render God mute. That's the argument here, right? And th now the tragic and horrific dimension of this is of course, right, that innocent people die as a result of the cruel callousness of those who block out God. Since God manifests his providential concern primarily in attempts to stir conscience rather than split seas, evildoers will sometimes, often, always, have their barbaric way with innocent victims. Heschel's theory of hysteropanim, the hiding of the divine face, is this. Human beings first turn away from God, and God, in turn, turns away from them. Divine hiding results from prior acts of human defiance. Heschel writes, quote, the will of God is to be here, manifest and near. But when God's will is thwarted, God leaves the world as if against God's own will. Now, again, we can talk later about whether this is a compelling theological argument. I mean, one um, friend of mine, um, who's a professor of philosophy of education, once said when he heard me trying to explain what I think Heschel's doing here, so in other words, the really bad parent who says to a kid, if you keep acting this way, I'm going to leave you here. God is that parent. Right? That, that, in other words, that's the critique. Is, is that what's implied here? Right? So I want to sort of put out, Heschel on the one hand is making an argument that some might find very compelling and inspiring, and yet it may also be deeply inadequate. And I think my point is here, I think Heschel knows that. Okay? Heschel is, is ambiguous about the dynamics of divine hiding. This, I think, is just kind of interesting. Passage 4, if you look in passage 4, on the one hand, it seems as if God makes an active decision to depart the world. Quote, when the doors of this world are slammed on God, his truth betrayed, his will defied, he withdraws, leaving man to himself. And yet, on the other hand, and often in the very same paragraph, 
Heschel seems to suggest not that God has chosen to leave, but that God has been displaced. That hester panim, the hiding of God's face, is not so much a description of what God does, but rather of what humanity does to God. Quote, same paragraph, God did not depart of his own volition, he was expelled. God is in exile. Now whether those two things can be said coherently at the same time is an interesting question, right? First, that God can no longer take it and chooses to leave, and that God is exiled and expelled. Heschel does not seem conscious of the fact that those images are in tension to some degree. Similarly, there's another important tension. Divine exile sometimes seems like a form of ontological rupture, by which I mean simply, he seems to suggest that something real has happened to God. Right? Something metaphysical has happened. There's a break in the world. And yet at other times, it seems that God's hiding is more epistemological than ontological, by which I simply mean it's not something about God. It's actually something about human perception of God. If human beings turn towards God, in other words, they can discover, we can discover, that God is in fact present after all. Passage 5, it is man who hides, who feels, who has an alibi. God is less rare than we think. When we long for him, his distance crumbles away. A hiding God, Heschel emphasizes, not a hidden God, teaching attributed to the Baal Shem Tov. He is waiting to be disclosed, to be admitted into our lives. So why isn't Breiterman right? Everything I just said, right? Why isn't Heschel simply to be understood as saying, look, it's our fault, not God's. We behave horribly, and God turns away. Either God has left, or God has been driven out. But the bottom line is, we are responsible and accountable. Why is that wrong? Isn't, in the end, based on what I said, Heschel offering a fairly conventional, even if there are twists and turns that are unique, but isn't he offering a fairly conventional defense of God? So let's take stock for a moment of where we've come until now. One, the real question of our time, Heschel suggests, is not about God, but about humanity. It is humanity's cruelty, rather than God's alleged indifference, that ought most to trouble us in thinking about when we live in history. Two, ours is an age of divine hiding, a hiding that follows upon and results from a human hiding that comes first. Three, but it is not a time of utter despair, because God still waits to be disclosed, to be let into human souls and deeds. And I'll talk a little bit next time about how for Heschel, that's one of the central meanings of tefillah, is creating a space within us and around us for God's presence to return into the world. Divine hiding, in other words, is emphatically for Heschel not equivalent to deserting humanity. God hides himself and curtails his power in the hopes of being discovered and responded to. That is, as I said last time, in the hunger for relationship. Fourth, Heschel turns to themes familiar to us from our study of cuts and emphasizes that faith and faithfulness are crucial in dark times. There are times, he writes, when defeat is all we face when horror is all that faith must bear. And yet, in spite of terror, we are never overcome with ultimate dismay. By the way, the word dismay has a much more intense valence for Heschel than I suspect it does for many of us if you think about what that word means. Dismay for him has a capital D, and it's something like existential despair. Sometimes I feel like dismay sounds like people who use it, I didn't like the way the person talked to me a fair way, and I was dismayed. He means something much more profound than that, obviously. Dismay is like a almost cosmically significant word. I don't know whether that's the right meaning of dismay, or that's one of the rare moments where, despite his poetry, there are moments of immigrants in English. Where I don't think he necessarily realizes how dismay is colloquially used. Um, but now, look what happens next. Okay, and this is where I think it gets it gets extraordinarily interesting. Heschel now cites a passage from the Book of Job, passage six. Quote: Even that it would please God to destroy me that he would let loose his hand and cut me off, then I should yet have comfort. Yea, I would exult even in my pain. Let him not spare me, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. We could spend the rest of the month trying to figure out what the mean. I want to just sort of acknowledge that. And that said, it makes it even more interesting that Heschel offers no explanation or elaboration of this characteristically very difficult passage in Job. No indication of how he wishes us to read it. 
At first glance, perhaps, it would seem to offer an example of the faithfulness amidst adversity that Heschel so admires. No matter what happens, Job says, I will not, I have not, and I will not abandon or deny God. But look a little closer, and the citation of this text becomes puzzling, maybe even baffling. Its message is starkly discontinuous with everything Heschel's been saying until now. First, the evil which befalls Job is not the work of human hands, and thus can't be attributed to human freedom. Second, and even more centrally, Job may be faithful, though his friends obviously think otherwise, but he is also furious, and his declaration of faith is suffused with anger and defiance. It's not what human beings did, and he's angry. Now, the precise meaning of Job's words here, as I said, is not entirely clear. But the tone of his remarks is unmistakable. Job is A, raging over B, what God has done to him. But in what we've seen of Heschel until now, A, there would appear to be no grounds for rage, since B, after all, it is not God who is the author of our suffering. Meaning, the placement of this pasuk here this Pesukim either is bad writing or is the beginning of Heschel beginning to unravel what he's just been saying, or to at very least show you the seams in what he's been saying, right? He said, there's no reason for anger at God because it's our fault. And then he quotes Job, who's angry at God and doesn't even consider the possibility that it's humanity's fault, right? Job represents the antithesis of what Heschel has been arguing. Reading closely, then, we catch a first intimation, I think, that Heschel does not think that his own arguments about divine exile and human responsibility are ultimately satisfactory. Indeed, there is a great deal more room for anger and confusion in his worldview than would appear from a surface reading. Heschel goes on. He quotes the Kutzker, who advises his students, quote, to lie in the dust and gorge on faith. Ligen drer und pasche dich mit like so many of the Kutzker statements, this one is epigrammatic and enigmatic. It's very hard to know what he meant. But its essential meaning, especially in this context, seems clear. No matter how low one has fallen, one should always nourish oneself with faith. Back, it seems, to faith in dark times. And yet, and yet, I wonder, because there is a subtle hint of anger in Heschel's comment, in Heschel's quote, cuts as well. Lie in the dust and gorge on faith. Pasha dich. Pasha dich. Pasha is a verb in Yiddish that can only be used with reference to animals. Human beings do not pasha. Animals do. Might there be some implicit protest here? some sense of indignation that human beings are reduced to an animal-like state and are told here, graze on this. Faith may nurture us, but being forced to graze on anything is hardly a dignified way for a human being to be forced to live. So my suggestion, in other words, here is we're beginning kind of slowly for those who want to read carefully, right, where he's pulling out the strings of the argument he's just made. Now, look what follows. Heschel quotes, in full, without so much as a single explanatory word, the most explosive and enraged psalm we have, Psalm 44. The psalm is perhaps the most audacious in Sefer Tehillim. It is a breathtaking mix of profound faith and bitter, blistering lament. What is this psalm doing here? I would ask it differently. If the conventional reading of Heschel is right, what on earth is this psalm doing here? Heschel, the Heschel who's just busy getting God off the hook and retracting his protest ends his discussion of evil and the Shoah by quoting the psalm that says, Ura, lama tishan Adonai, right? Wake up, God. Why are you sleeping? Why are you hiding your face? Where are you? On the one hand, the psalm does contain another declaration of faith amidst dark times. Despite finding itself in humiliating circumstances, Israel refuses to abandon its faith. But on the other hand, like Job, the psalmist is angry and indignant. 
If your conventional view of the Psalms is that they are all poems of yearning for closeness with a sugary sweet God, I mean, right? This, there are psalms of just unbelievably explosive anger and frustration with God. Um, <coughs> psalm 44, actually one famous um, German Bible scholar describes Psalm 44 as the national version of the book of Job. Right? In other words, it's, it's the people's version of Job's individual suffering. Psalm 44 audaciously contrasts Israel's heroic faithfulness to God's horrific faithlessness. <laughs> Right? We have been faithful, but you, on the other hand, the psalmist does not doubt that God is in control of history. This is where it gets interesting. The psalmist does not doubt that God is in control of history, but he is appalled by what he sees as God's unconscionable failures. Now, needless to say, I hope, by the way, if you had more time, we would read this psalm slowly, carefully. In some ways, it's much more interesting than what I'm saying, so if you want to read it while I'm talking, that's fine. Needless to say, None of this can easily be integrated with Heschel's theology as expressed in the first part of this chapter. What is this doing here? Until the citation from Job, we had heard about God's being in exile, about the ways in which human freedom, rather than divine agency, was ultimately responsible for human cruelty and the degradation of human life. But the psalmist, the author of Psalm 44, will have none of this. God is still the God of history. And God is obligated to be faithful to the covenant. Surely there ought to be limits to divine self-limitation. Are there not moments when self-transcendence is in fact indistinguishable from abandonment? The psalmist laments not the unbearable result of human freedom, but the tragic and outrageous incomprehensibility of divine silence. And no, Heschel ends with that. Not another word of comment, not a word of explication. Heschel does not do anything to soften or mitigate or even to admit, interpret this psalm. He doesn't tell us what role he intends it to play in his book, let alone in our religious life. But I would suggest, and this is where I'm offering you know, this kind of revisionist understanding of what Heschel is doing, I would suggest that bringing the psalm enables Heschel to express in a traditionally rooted way what he might otherwise have found inexpressible or even blasphemous, right? Namely, his simmering anger at God's ultimately inexplicable silence at Auschwitz. At the very least, the citation of Psalm 44 serves as a way of admitting, though without being forced to say so in so many words, that all theodicy falls short of explaining, let alone justifying, Israel's horrific fate, whether in the psalmist's time or in Heschel's. Now, I just want to say something that's purely analyzing the structure of the chapter. Why am I so convinced that Braderman and everyone who follows him are wrong in the way they popularize Heschel's view? If they were right, we have a question raised by the psalm, God, why do you hide your face? And then we have an answer, the one Heschel provides, I hide my face because you've turned away from me. But what we have in this chapter is in fact the exact opposite. First we have the answer, here's why God hides his face. And only then do we have a reaffirmation of the question, why do you hide your face? If the point of this were to simply let God off the hook, it would make a lot more sense to introduce the psalm, ask the question, and then offer a theological answer. Instead, what you have if you read the chapter is a theological answer, followed by a thunderous reiteration of the question. <coughs> That does not seem to me to be in any way, I do not think you can do a good reading of this that suggests he thinks he solved the problem. I would venture the following rather not that bold hypothesis. Anyone who wants to solve the problem of evil will not end their discussion of the problem of evil by quoting Psalm 44 in its entirety and saying nothing about it. That may be the last text in Tanakh you would quote to make that point. You begin with an answer. And then you reiterate the question, why God? Why do you hide your face? In other words, what we have here, not a question followed by an answer, by an answer, but, but an answer followed by a not too subtle admission that the answer itself is woefully inadequate. An answer followed by an admission. Maybe this is the broad contour of the theodicy, but of course I realize it's not good enough. 
I want to suggest that Heschel finds himself in a double bind. On the one hand, he can't bring himself to pretend that he has neatly solved the problem of human suffering. But on the other hand, neither can he allow himself to express the extent of his anger and his doubt. Maybe during the question and answer, I can speculate a little bit more about why. I think if you go back to what I talked about in some of the previous lectures about how badly he thinks humanity needs God, there's an enormous risk for him in giving full voice to his own frustration with God. The psalmist functions in the early Heschel in the same way that Kutzker does in the later Heschel. We started with the later and then moved to the early, right? So in the first part of what I talked about tonight, the Kutzker is the stand-in for Heschel's death. And in the second part, it is the author of Psalm 44. They are vehicles for expressing Heschel's own most conflicted religious thoughts and passions. In his own, maybe awkward way, Heschel both offers the broad contours of a theodicy and an inchoate, not fully articulated admission that it's inadequate. Job had many successors, Heschel writes, quote, and the Kutzker was one of them. In a much lower key, I'm suggesting, so too was Heschel himself. Far from being resolved, the problem of evil persists as a terrible source of agony in his writings. Now, I want to just make a kind of literary observation about this chapter that I find interesting. By quoting the psalm the way it does, the chapter, in effect, imitates the psalm. The psalm builds to a deeper and deeper tension between God and Israel. And though the reader might expect or hope for some resolution, there is none on offer. The psalm ends with an angry call to a sleeping God and a plea for God to manifest God's mercy. In quoting this psalm without commentary, I think Heschel chapter ends in precisely the same way, with an attempt to rouse God and an entreaty for divine intervention. The fundamental dissonance, the coupling of deep faith with profound anger, remains. It's not dissolved, and it's not explained away. Okay. Now, one last set of observations about all this. There is something that I think is very important to understand about Heschel. With very rare exceptions, his expressions of anger always emerge from within a position of faith. In other words, Heschel's protests are precisely that. They are protests from within a relationship rather than articulations of metaphysical doubt from outside of them, right? You do not really find in Heschel, oh, in light of the Holocaust, I wonder whether it even makes sense to talk about God at all. That's a metaphysical doubt from outside a relationship. What you find in Heschel is explosive frustration from within a relationship. What's wrong with you, right? It's a very different approach. For Heschel, in other words, there really is no question that God exists. I think, by the way, it's a footnote, but that's one of the things that makes Heschel both so appealing and also hard